here isn't this fun what a jolly wheeze as we would say hold on i'm going live again on facebook if it'll play because it doesn't always and it's deeply frustrating okay so hopefully i'm back on facebook now and hopefully because i fiddled around with the settings there i should have sound so hank if you could find me again on facebook and confirm we have sound that would be brilliant and that way we can start start this all again so how is everyone <laughs> well i'm waiting for a sli uh, quick confirmation that the sound on facebook is good if it isn't i'm just going to continue on instagram and um yes audio is fixed woohoo okay i am a technological wizard no i'm not I, i'm not even going to pretend i am i'm rubbish with all things technical but that seemed to work okay so without further ado let me introduce you to today's book Ta -da! you even get, got to see my ring light there aren't you lucky so lisa unger's the stranger inside yeah you can see that there you can see it on facebook wonderful yes and carla and glennie are all confirming that the sound is there wonderful so this is the book i'm reading from today and let me tell you the prologue is so deliciously creepy it's brilliant and lisa is watching on instagram so as always we will save these videos let me straighten straighten myself up a bit here um we'll save the videos to instagram to the feed but also to facebook and Lisa's watching, so leave her leave her some comments you know, as I'm reading or, or afterwards on Facebook. And once we've posted it to Instagram as well, you'll be able to post comments there as well. And I keep looking at my phone. I should look up here as well, because that's where Facebook is right there. And this is where Instagram is. I'm out of practice. Once a week just isn't enough, is it? So let me tell you a little bit about Lisa, because she is quite the powerhouse author. So let me read you her bio. And I'm also going to say if I get booted out by one system or the other, because it does happen sometimes, if Facebook just cuts me off because it doesn't like what I'm saying, or Instagram doesn't like what I'm saying and cuts me off, I'll continue on the platform that allows me to broadcast and go back to the one that kicked me out. You know, go get yourself a cup of tea or a coffee or something and, and then come back and I'll start again. But fingers crossed, that won't happen and we have now put the technology issues at the beginning behind us and it'll be plain sailing from here okay so lisa unger who is lisa well she is the new york times and internationally best-selling author of 18 novels that's right 18 if you haven't read any of them you have 18 to catch up on including her forthcoming novel, Confessions on the 745, which publishes in October, and from which I'm delighted to say we will also be reading from on First Chapter Fun in a couple of months. So you have that to look forward to as well. With millions of readers worldwide and books published in 26 languages, Lisa is widely regarded as a master of suspense. Yeah, no kidding, no doubt about that. Her critically acclaimed books have been voted best of the year or top picks by the Today Show, Good Morning America, Entertainment Weekly, Amazon, IndieBound and others. Her essays have appeared in none other than the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR and Travel and Leisure. Would that be leisure? I guess it would be leisure for you guys. Not for me, it's leisure. <laughs> it rhymes with pleasure. <laughs> she lives on the west coast of Florida with her family and today we are reading from last year's book so this one is out now you don't have to wait you can get your hands on it now because it published last September The Stranger Inside I'm going to make sure yes you can see that on Instagram you can see that on Facebook fantastic I know it's back to front on Instagram it's still back to front on Instagram please fix that people um, because on Facebook it isn't, but on Instagram, for whatever reason, it is. But you can all see that, the stranger inside. So let me read you the, um, the, the blurb, the, the back cover copy. Lisa Unger's latest, The Stranger Inside, is a dark psychological thriller about a woman forced to confront the dark secrets of her past when a serial killer strikes too close to home. 
Twelve-year-old Rain Winter narrowly escaped an abduction while walking to a friend's house. Her two best friends, Tess and Hank, were not as lucky. Tess never came home, and Hank was held in captivity before managing to escape. Their abductor was sent to prison, but years later was released. Then someone delivered real justice and killed him in cold blood. Now Rain is living the perfect suburban life, her dark childhood buried deep. She spends her days as a stay-at-home mum, having put aside her career as a hard-hitting journalist to care, to care for her infant daughter. But when another brutal murderer who escaped justice is found dead, Rain is unexpectedly drawn into the case. Eerie similarities to the murder of her friend's abductor force Rain to revisit memories she's worked hard to leave behind. Is there a vigilante at work? Who is the next target? Why can't Rain just let it go? Introducing one of the most compelling and original killers in crime fiction today, Lisa Unger takes readers deep inside the minds of both perpetrator and victim, blurring the lines between right and wrong, crime and justice, and showing that sometimes people deserve what comes to them. You think that's creepy and delicious? Just wait for the prologue, which I'll read to you in just a second. Here we go. I had an itchy nose there and I thought I'm going to sneeze when I'm reading this and I'll ruin it. But I didn't. The Stranger Inside by Lisa Unger. And this is, of course, read with the wonderful permission from Lisa and Park Row Books, the publisher. I'm going to put my glasses on now because I can't see otherwise. <laughs> so. All right, so this is the prologue of The Stranger Inside by Lisa Unger. Last night. I wait because I have nothing but time. From the quiet, dim interior of my car, I watch the quiet neighbourhood settle into the upholstery. Autumn, leaves lofting on cool air, tacky, ghoulish Halloween decorations adorning stoops and lawns, Hanging from trees, skeletons and jack-o'-lanterns, witches on brooms. It's a school night, so no kids playing flashlight tag, no pick-up soccer match in the street. Maybe kids don't even do that anymore. That's what I understand anyway, that they're all iPad-addicted couch potatoes now. It's the new frontier of parenting, but you'll know better about this than I'm likely to. Younger families live on this block. SUVs are hastily parked. Basketball hoops tilt in driveways. Bikes twist on the lawn. Recycling cans wait patiently at the curb on Wednesday. Garbage on Friday. Tonight, there's a game on. I see it playing on big screen televisions in three different open plan living rooms. But the house I'm watching is dark. A beautiful silver Benz that's about to be repossessed sits in the driveway. It's one of those cars, the kind that people dream about, an aspirational car, the kind you get when... But it certainly hasn't brought its owner any happiness. The guy I'm watching, he's depressed. I can see it in his slouch as he comes and goes, in the haunted circles that have settled around his eyes. I can't muster any compassion for him, and I know that you aren't shedding any tears. In fact, I'm willing to bet that you've spent at least as much time thinking about him as I have, even though, of course, you have other things on your mind now. An older man walks his dog, a white puff of a thing on a slender leash. Not a dog at all, really, more like an extra-large guinea pig. I sink a little deeper in my seat, then stay stone still. I haven't seen this man on this street before, and I've been here most nights for a while. He's out of his routine, I guess. Maybe decided to take a new route tonight. I'm not too worried, though. My car, a beige Toyota Corolla, is utterly forgettable, practically invisible in its commonness. The window's tinted, but not too dark. If he doesn't see me, a lone person slouched in the driver's seat and clearly up to no good, he won't even notice it. I'm in luck. 
He's squinting at the screen on his smartphone. Older, not fluent with it. It takes all his concentration. That device is the best thing that ever happened to people who want to be invisible. He walks right by, oblivious to the car, to me, to his surroundings. Even his dog is distracted, incurious, nose to the pavement, sniff, sniff, sniff. Finally, they're gone and I'm alone again. Time passes. I breathe into the night. One by one, windows go dark, except for the odd light here and there. There's an insomniac in 704, a nurse who comes home after 3am on Wednesdays and Fridays to 708. Just after 2am, I slip from the car, close the door silently and shoulder my pack. I am a shadow shifting through the shadows of the trees, drifting, silent, up the edge of the house. I easily pick the lock on the side entrance. You can learn how to do anything on YouTube these days and enter the house through the unlocked interior door. From the garage into the laundry room, from the laundry room into the kitchen, a typical suburban layout. I stand inside for a moment, listening. I can still hear it, you know, the sound of her father's voice. I'm willing to bet that you hear it too. Maybe in those quiet moments when you lie in bed at night, the wail of total despair comes back like a haunting. I imagine that your mind drifts back to that courtroom, your face pulled tight with that helpless mingle of anger and sorrow, nostrils flaring just slightly. I was right there with you, even though you didn't know it. Or maybe you did. Sometimes I wonder if you know how close I am, if you sense me. When the verdict was delivered, there was a moment, remember? A tiny sliver of time where the information moved through synapses and neurons, a heartbeat. In that breath, I watched her mother drain of what little energy and colour remained in her too thin body. I watched her father buckle over, her brother dip his head into his hands. The unforgiving light of the courtroom grew brighter somehow, an ugly white sizzle. And then the room exploded in a wave of sound that contained all the notes of despair, disbelief, rage. I'd been there before, in the presence of injustice, as have you. You know how it wafts like smoke from the black spaces beneath tables and chairs. It rises up, tall and menacing. I was always here, it seems to say as it looms over you, towering, victorious. It brings you to your knees. In the presence of nothing else do you feel smaller or more powerless. When we're young, we're naive enough to believe. We're raised on the comic book ideal of good vanquishing equal. We believe that white magic is stronger than black, that criminals are punished and justice is always served, even when it seems that evil might triumph. No, in that final moment, a cosmic force does the reckoning for good one way or another. We want to believe that, but it's not so, not always. Sometimes justice needs a little push. I make a quick loop through the house to assure myself that everything is as it was the last time I was here. The decor is Target, Ikea chic, white and dove grey with bold accent patterns. There are lots of those picture collages with words like love and dream and family. Her parents, smiling and benevolent. Her wedding photos, gauzy, a fairy tale dream. A gaggle of gap-toothed nieces and nephews. Girls night out, toasting with pink drinks in martini glasses. Throw pillows and soft blankets, knick-knacks, decorative pieces of driftwood are artfully arranged. She was house proud, the woman who lived here once. She liked things pretty and comfortable. Now, surfaces are covered with dust. Her home? It smells like garbage. As I finish my tour, I feel a twist of sadness for her. Here's someone who did everything right. She followed all the rules, went to college, worked in public relations, got married, got pregnant, pretty and, by all accounts, sweet and kind. And look, her cute house, her little dreams, her innocent life, empty, rotting. She deserved better. Nothing I can do about that. But this is the next best thing. I know what you're thinking. 
what anyone might think. Who am I to say that a man found innocent by a jury of his peers is guilty as sin? And even if he is, who am I to deliver justice? It's true. I am no one. But this is how I knew. When Lainey Markham went missing, I immediately suspected that it was her oh-so-handsome husband. Because, <laughs> let's get real, the incident of stranger crime is a statistical anomaly. We both have a thing or two to add to that conversation, don't we? But I'm sure you'd agree that statistically it's true. The idea of the other, the stranger, the destroyer who breaks into your home and kills your family or takes your child, it does happen, but not as often as a man kills his wife, or a father rapes his daughter, or an uncle molests his niece. Those things don't always make the news. Why? Because it's not news. That's the everyday horror show of normal life. So there's that, the it's always the husband thing. But what sealed it for me was those national morning show appearances. He did the circuit, ostensibly to plead for the lovely Laney's safe return. Tall, with movie star good looks, he was a natural. And those morning show hosts, they lapped it up. Laney, she was a beauty too. One of those luscious pregnant girls, even prettier with her little baby belly, glowing skin and silky, hormone-rich hair. If the Markhams had been less good looking, this would have been less of a story. You know it's true. Anyway, he gets on camera and starts to weep, and I mean blubber. Steve Markham stares right at the camera, tears streaming down his face, and he begs for whoever took his wife and unborn child to just bring them home. Quite a performance. Except men don't cry like that. Men, when they are overcome by emotion to the degree that they lose control and start to weep, they cover their faces. Crying is a disobeying of every cultural message a man ever receives. To weep like a woman? It fills him with shame, so he covers his face. That's how I knew he killed his wife. Steve Markham was a sociopath. Those tears were as fake as they come. You remember. I know you were thinking the same thing. You might say that's not enough. I know you. You follow the rules, or anyway, you have a kind of a code. But we all know there was enough physical evidence to send the bastard to the electric chair. It was those lawyers with all their tricks, cast doubt on this, get that thrown out, confuse and mislead the slack-jawed jury with complicated cell phone evidence. This satellite says he was there at the time, couldn't have done it. Still, I generally wait a year, just to be sure. I watch and wait, do my research, at least a year sometimes much, much longer, as you know. I choose very carefully. I think about it long and hard, because it would suck to be wrong. I wouldn't, couldn't justify that. It's a line I can't step over, really, because then, what am I? Anyway, my old friend, I'm gratified to report that the year since he was acquitted of his wife's murder has been very bad for Steve Markham. He lost his job, all his friends, his lover slash alibi Tammy. You remember her, right? The whole case hung on that mousy blonde from Hoboken. Well, she broke up with him. I'm sure you know all this. If I know you, you're keeping tabs too. You probably didn't know that for a while he hung around Tammy's place, stalking. I thought we were going to have a problem, that I'd have to act before I was ready. But Steve is nothing else if not a smart guy. Probably figured it wouldn't look great if his girlfriend turned up dead less than a year after his wife's body was found in a shallow grave just miles from her own home. She and her unborn child killed by multiple stab wounds with a six-inch serrated blade from her own kitchen. He finally stopped following Tammy, the one that got away. He's about to lose the house. Last month, the lights went out. The pool, where they think he killed his wife, has turned green, water thick now with algae. Sure, he had his book deal. He did the talk show circuit, this time playing the innocent man, wrongly accused on a tireless hunt for his, killer's, for his wife's killer. 
He'd been unfaithful, he admitted, grim and remorseful. He was sorry, so sorry. More crocodile tears. He burned through the advance money fast. It wasn't that much. Between agent commission, taxes, it was no windfall. He might have made it last, but people don't get it. Money, if you don't protect it, is flammable. It goes up in flames and floats away like ash. The IRS is after him now, the system. Maybe it does have its way of getting you, even if you slip through its cracks at first. I make no attempt to be quiet as I unpack my bag. I drape a plastic tarp over the couch, lay another one in front of the door where he will enter the room when he hears me. I lay things out, the duct tape, the hunting knife. There's a gun I carry in a shoulder holster, the sleek light Beretta PX4 compact carry with a handy Ameriglow night sight and talon grip. It's only meant to inspire cooperation. To have to use it will represent a failure of planning on my part but there are always variables for which you can't account. By the time he rouses from sleep and moves cautiously into the front room, I'm sitting in one of the cheap wing-back chairs by the window. He's not armed. I know there's no weapon in this house. There was a baseball bat under the bed. Maybe he thought that some day Lainey's brother or her father would come for him, but the baseball bat is gone now in the trunk of my very forgettable car, in fact. Hello, Steve, I say quietly and watch him jump back. Have a seat. Who are you? I work the Cerakote slide that puts a bullet into the chamber and watch him freeze. It's a sound a man recognises even if he's never had a gun pulled on him before. On the couch. The plastic tarp crinkles beneath his weight and he starts to cry again. This time, it's real. Please. His voice is small with fear and regret. But do I also hear relief? We all believe that story, that cheaters never win and justice will be done. Even the bad guys believe it. Isn't that right, my old friend? That was the brilliant, brilliant opening of The Stranger Inside by Lisa Unger. I just absolutely loved that. That was just, ah, so chilling. It's fantastic, fantastic. I hope you enjoyed that. I see lots of, lots and lots of, wow, lots of comments on Facebook. This is brilliant. And questions for you there as well, Lisa. So I hope you'll be able to, um, to answer those. Fabulous book, out now. You can get your hands on it right now, um, as you should. <laughs> I think so anyway. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be reading from Confessions on the 745 in a couple of months. That's Lisa's book that comes out in October. But you can read this one or any of her other 17 or 18 books in total, um, should you wish to, which you should. So <laughs> that was today's reading. So much fun. Thank you for for uh, stopping by and listening, that's brilliant. We will be back on Thursday. Oh, no, wrong. I was about to show you the, the cover for the next one. No, that's a picture. <laughs> you know, you got those funny filters on, on, um, on uh, uh, iPads and iPhones and stuff. That was my one of my boys uh, popping a funny photograph in there. That's not what we'll be doing on Thursday. This is the book we'll be reading from on Thursday, Girls Like Us by Christina Alga. Let me just make sure, yep, you see that really well on Instagram and really well on Facebook too. So this is Thursday's read. As always, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, I hope you'll join us then. I hope you enjoyed today's reading and I hope you're all staying safe and sane in these still really rather trying times, that's for sure. So I uh, do hope you'll you'll be uh, around on Thursday again for first chapter fun. And until then, as always, please stay safe, stay kind, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you for watching. <laughs>